in your head here. All right. So as we start off, uh, first thing we're going to do is uh, grab on to one of the uh, points that he puts is that we're called to be gardeners. And here's why this is so huge is because when we talk about having a discussion with someone with G- about Jesus or leading someone to Jesus, often, and, and I've felt this, there's this pressure like, I've got to get you all the way to the cross to where you repent and you give your life to Jesus. And we want to start with saying, that's probably not going to be our goal, nor should it be our goal. All right? Our goal is to think of ourselves using the parable that Jesus used as gardeners. Uh, and think about gardening. It is a slow process. In fact, I'm a terrible gardener because of how slow the gardening process <laughs> is. Because I get excited when we plant, and then nothing happens, right? And then the next day, nothing happens. And about two weeks later, I'm still looking for something to happen, right? And about three weeks later, I can no longer tell what's a weed and what I planted because my weeds are coming up. And about five weeks later, I'm so bored, I've already moved on in my mind, and whatever happens, happens, right? If it survives, it survives. And so I'm, I'm a terrible gardener because it requires a certain amount of patience, but not just patience, it requires knowledge. You see, if I could tell the difference between the weed and the plant coming up, I might be able to pull the right one. <laughs> Because when they're coming up, I'm, I'm afraid. Like, did I just plant that? It's kind of in my row. I mean, this right here is obviously weed, but right here's my rose. That's pretty close to my row. Should I pull that or not? Now, all that being said is that when we do evangelism or apologetic work, and again, it's giving reason for what we believe, giving defense of our faith, it's a slow, patient process, but it requires knowledge, and it requires some some grace and skill and patience. All right? And what I want to do is immediately relieve the idea and alleviate the pressure that most of us feel when we talk about talking with someone about Jesus, like, oh, I've got to lead them all the way to the cross. Uh, what would it be like, and Greg Hopel uses the idea, I'm putting a pebble in someone's shoe. I want to help them see that their worldview is uncomfortable. And so that when they're living with their worldview, they're going, eh, this doesn't feel so good. Now, Here's one of the major changes that's happened. People are no longer leaning into the church. And at least in this room, we're old enough to all remember and see the change over time. At one point in time, uh, evangelism was taught and apologetics was taught that, all right, you need to tell someone about Jesus. You need to ask them this question. and You can lead them to Jesus by doing X and X and X and X. And we've got a seat right over there for you, dear. I care if someone's thinking. And we can, we can lead them to Jesus, and they're really hungry. And and many times they were, right? There was a bunch of people who were kind of wanting to understand the church, wanting to understand what's going on. And times have changed. And people are no longer leaning into the church and have a trust of the church and look to the pastor as someone who's a leader in the community and someone who's got answers, but rather now people are leaning away from the church. And they no longer look to the pastor as someone who's got answers. In fact, sometimes they look at the pastor and go, hey, that's... That's someone we can't trust. Uh, Pastors and lawyers kind of got in the same category somewhere along the way. Some of that's fair, some of that's not fair. Uh, People are leaning away from the church because they've uh, learned that, hey, the the gospel (coughs) message, there's a couple holes in it, right? And where did they learn that? Well, they learned that from watching a YouTube video, right? This is something that many of us, our grandkids and kids deal with, right? They've got objections to the faith that you're like, where did you even hear that? Well, they watched it on YouTube. They read it on Wikipedia. One of their friends at school watched it on YouTube, and then they told them about it. Right? And so it's a whole generation of overload of knowledge and information that our culture is now hostile to the gospel. Uh, and so our goal is often a little too lofty if we're going to say, hey, I'm going to lead you to Jesus today. Rather, I'm a gardener, and so I'm going to till the ground. Now, if you're like me, the frustrating point with that means is that 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 may take two, three, four years. In fact, it may take so long that I don't get to ever harvest in the sense I don't ever get to lead them to Jesus. Uh, I had a good friend in high school that I worked for years to lead to Jesus. The year after I graduated, I found another friend led him to Jesus. And I was like, are you kidding me? (laughs) I spent like four years talking to him about Christ and just loving on this guy. Then part of me was excited, and part of me was a little jealous that he got to do it. But at the end of the day, I was like, hey, it's for the kingdom, right? 
This is great. <coughs> and this is, it shouldn't surprise us because this is what Jesus says, right? He says, hey, the ground's already been tilled. People have already planted. Uh, now you go do the harvest. But he says some are to be the harvest or some are to be the tillers. And so we all have a part to play. And again, the point there is that it's a slow-moving process. Uh, one of my favorite stories is of Tiffany who comes to church on occasion. And again, she will tell you that, hey, I knew that guy for four years. For four years, he was kind and caring to me and would talk to me. And at four years, God finally gave me a door open in, enough to invite her to church. But it took four years to win her trust. Uh, why? Because good evangelism, good discipleship starts with trust. Good evangelism, good discipleship starts with trust. I do have a garden story. Yeah, sure. Well, I, we sell mums and, and our hand-planted things at the apple butter festival. We have the same people come back almost every year, especially for our our plants that we planted because we can tell them how to take care of them you know where they've come from yeah. what they need to do where they should have them and they value that information yeah. and they can go get the same mom at Orgeson or whatever else but we can tell them where to plant the mom or how to keep it until they want to plant it or we can give them the information that they right. don't usually get or don't want to be dumb about you know, if they go to a real nursery. So they trust us and they come back every year for our house. And it's a little business principle here, especially if you're doing small businesses. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, they're coming to you because of the word, it starts with a T, trust. Yes. They've learned they can trust these mm -hmm. people, and so we're going to keep coming back, we're going to keep coming back, keep coming back, keep coming back. Now, we're going to play a little game here real quick. We're going to give you a couple questions, and I want you to think about what your response would be. Okay, you ready? Uh, and these are in your book on page 52. You don't need to read them. Uh, but on page 52 if you're looking. All right, you're at a dinner party with a close friend from church. The conversation naturally goes from a number of interesting spiritual topics, and suddenly, to your surprise and embarrassment, the host's 15-year-old son announces with some belligerent that he doesn't believe in God anymore. It's simply not rational. There's no proof. You have 10 seconds. What are you going to say? I love you anyway. I love you anyway. Okay. Conversation would end there probably, right? Mm -hmm. So that's probably not, I mean, it's a good thing. Uh, I mean, yeah. Right. I mean, it's a good thing. And no, I don't know that it would end, but, you know, <laughs> thinking of your conversations I've had with Julie. Mm -hmm. What's your proof for what? The comment. Yeah. You would say that again. Yeah, I would say that to sure. the kid. What's your proof? Mm -hmm. She was cheating. She was at Bible study today. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, so uh, here's the point that, that Craig Kogel is going to lead you into. He's going to lead you into something called tactics. And it's a way to engage the conversation tactfully. All right? Uh, so we already have the strategy. The strategy is we're going to lead someone to Jesus, and we have that. All right? And often the church, in the larger part, we have a discipleship strategy. But now we need tactics that when we're engaged with someone, we can maneuver the conversation in appropriate ways to help them lower their defenses and help us all right, direct the conversation towards Jesus Christ. Now Jesus was a master of this. Right? And the way Greg's going to encourage us to do this is with questions. In fact, the first thing he's going to teach you is called the Columbo. Uh, the Columbo uh, tactic. And do you remember the, the show Columbo? Uh -huh. and most of you are old. Yeah. I said this to my kids. They're like, who? <laughs> Columbus always comes in in that trench coat, yep. disheveled, looks like he's been sleeping in his car the past four days, right? And and uh, he shows up, he's got the little notepad, right? And uh, and then he, 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 can, he never has anything to write with, right? And he's always like, anybody got a pencil? Anybody got a pencil? I need, I need a pencil, right? All right? And so he's, he's got a pencil. So he looks like this goofy, dim-witted guy. And here's the case, you're, you're going to discuss it, and, and he goes, all right, let me make sure I got this correct. Let me make sure I understand this. And so he's just asking you to give the story again, and so he hears the story, and, and you see him kind of, oh, I know, I know. And he makes a few jotting notes, and as a viewer, if you were watching for the first time, you're like, is that guy even, like, is this guy on drugs? It's like, he does not look like he knows what he's doing, right? 
Now, and what the point there would be that here's a very inoffensive guy asking simple questions, but he's brilliant at what he does, right? Because he'll come back just before he's left, and he's already asked two or three questions. And I got one more question for you, right? And then somehow in that one more question, he strung out the person to the point where now they're actually cornered themselves, right? Now that's one of the tactics that we want to teach you. In fact, it's it's Greg Kopel's favorite tactic, and it's, and it's become one of my favorite tactics as I've been discipled under him. Is how do I use the Colombo tactic to just simply ask questions to help you go, oh darn, I've been cornered, all right? And the beauty of it is, is when you use the Colombo tactic, at no point in time do you even have to tell them what your worldview is. You may agree with what they say. Right? But you're going to do it in such a way that it's not offensive. You're just leading them down the trail. You're in charge of the conversation. Why? Because you're asking questions. And you're asking questions of someone that's about their favorite subject themselves. What they want to believe, right? What their worldview is. What makes them tick, right? And so everybody loves to talk about themselves. And so you're just asking the questions. But you're doing it in such a way that you know there's a place you want to get to. And you're trying to get in there. Now, pause before we go any further. This is so huge. Our evangelism, our apologetics, our questions that we're going to ask, all our tactics are not to score points. They're not to win arguments. They're not to be the best. They're not to defeat somebody. They have one goal. That's to love them. And the most loving thing I can do is lead you to Christ. Now, remember, though, our goal Right? Our goal isn't in every conversation to get someone to the cross where they repent and give their life to Jesus, right? And so my goal in loving you may be that day I just became your friend. Again, I'm going to put a pebble in your shoe to help you see that your worldview is actually uncomfortable to live in. I don't have to take you all the way there. In fact, sometimes the best conversations that I've had that I didn't know were the best conversations I had till later were when I didn't. I just took them one or two questions deep. One or two questions is very inoffensive, right? Yeah. Well, Aaron's a nice guy. He, You know, he really listens. And everybody loves someone who listens, right? Now, again, there's no cloak and dagger. There's no hidden thing of what I'm doing. I really care, right? Because if I have the heart of Christ, I really care about everybody I run into. I mean, it doesn't mean I like everybody I run into, but I really do care. And so everybody that I run into, I really want to get to know them because the only way I'm going to lead them to Christ is if I get to know them. Now, there are those strange rare street evangelism moments. Those are not for normal people in the sense that those are not your everyday occurrence, okay? Uh, that's a special gift that someone often has. It doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means that most of us are going to lead someone to Jesus in the midst and in the context of a relationship. So here's my relationship. I'm at a dinner party. It's my friend. It's his son that stands up and says this, and your answer is absolutely correct, which is, well, why do you believe that? Now, can you see Colombo asking that? Oh, well, that's, a, that's, a, that's really interesting, young man. Now, can you can you tell me why you believe that, right? Now, there's nothing offensive about that, right? In fact, I haven't said what I believe, and if he doesn't know I'm the pastor, no big deal, right? And all I've done is say, hey, explain why you believe that. Now, here's what's interesting. Probably 50% of the people you would ask that question don't really know why they believe God doesn't exist, they don't really, it's because it's a popular belief, it's because of what their friend said, they saw it on YouTube, but they can't remember any of the reasons behind it, right? Now, they may have one or two reasons. Here's the good news. You are part of the team that has the truth, part of the team that has the right answers. You don't ever have to be afraid of what someone's going to say. And because you're in the Colombo tactic gear, uh, methodology rather, you're simply asking the question, so if somebody answers in such a way that you're like, oh shoot, I can't respond, which by the way, he's going to teach you uh, next week on how to get out of the hot seat, all right? Again, there's no pressure, right? All you've done is ask a question. And if you are then go, oh, there's another open door, I can ask another question. So uh, the person says, uh, it's simply not rational to believe in God. There's no proof. Really? Why, why, do you, why do you believe that? Okay. Simple question. Why do you believe what you believe? Well, uh, 
You see, I, everything started with the Big Bang. <coughs> everything started with the Big Bang, so you know we don't need a God for the Big Bang. What's your next? What's your next thing you're gonna say? Were you there? Well, the answer is obviously <laughs> no. <laughs> well, again, funny, but I'll take it from there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just follow your Columbo. What's what's you're, you're you're gonna ask a question? Why do you believe that? Okay, we could say why do you believe that? Okay, because what the person hasn't done is they haven't really given an explanation. They just gave an opinion. Come on in here. Hand the hand one of those over right there. Right? They haven't explained anything. They've given a statement, but they haven't really explained like, hey, this is why. And so my next question would be. How do you how did explain the Big Bang to me? Explain what you believe with that, right? I'm going to follow the Colombo tactic, and now they're going to explain the Big Bang. Now the reason that I'm going to go there first is because the Big Bang and its explanations have become. I mean, there's fifty six thousand of them, right? I mean, there's people who think this is how it happened, this is how it happened, this is how it happened, this is how it happened. So I want to hear what the person has to say. I want to hear what their comment is first. Now, if you look on page two. You're going to see the Colombo question in the middle of the page. Okay? Goals of the question. You see that? Goal of the question? What do you mean by it? Colombo tactic. What do you mean by it? All right? So I want to draw them out, and now I'm going to invite them to talk. So what do you mean by the Big Bang? Explain the Big Bang to me. All right? So now they're explaining the Big Bang to me. Well, eventually, everybody's Big Bang theory has to go back to, and, and then there was a Big Bang. Okay, so my next question is going to be, who made the bang? Well, what do you mean? Well, I think the laws of science teach us that, same thing that we learned from the sound of music, mm -hmm. nothing comes from nothing, nothing. right? Mm -hmm. And so somebody had to do the big bang, or Greg Kogel likes to say, a big bang needs a big banger, right? A big bang needs a big banger. So somewhere along the way, now I, in three questions, I've, I've cornered that person. I haven't done it belligerently. I haven't done it offensively. I haven't even shared my opinion or my view. I've simply walked them back to their viewpoint, trying to understand what they believe. Because that's the goal, number three, understand what they think, right? So I've drawn them out. I've invited them to talk, and now I'm wanting to know what they think. And when I get them to a place, this is I, I say this: most worldviews that are not a Christian worldview fall fall apart at the third layer. Usually, by the third question, someone else's worldview is falling apart because it's not based on truth. Now that doesn't mean it will; it just means that usually in a conversation, and part of that's because most people aren't educated enough in, other, in their own worldview or another worldview to sustain more than two or three questions. Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. right. One of the, by the way, we're going to practice this at the end of the class because I have, I've come to believe that the only way to get good at this is to do it and to mess it up. Why? Because when you were learning to ride your bike, the only way you learned to do it wasn't to sit there and have someone say, now, when you get on the bike, you're going to move your feet like this motion. You're like, I'm going to move my feet, but that's my arms, right? No, no, no. Okay, show you how to, uh, right? And again, there's no way to teach someone how to ride a bike just standing beside it, right? And eventually, okay, I'm going to put you on. But I'm going to help you, right? I'm going to stay behind you, and I'm going to walk beside you, holding the back seat, right? And eventually you're going to learn to pedal. Well, guess what? This is our training wheels room, okay? I'm going to walk with you, and I'm going to be here to help you. And, well, there you go. You're on your own. Good. It doesn't mean later when you're on your own you won't ever wreck. Because I have. Even I wreck now. I, oh, man, I should have done that different. I should have asked a different question. And I'm always practicing. I'm always getting better at it. Uh, but we're going to practice this in just uh, by the end of the class. All right. Uh, number two, it's the night of your weekly Bible study group. During the discussion of Sunday's sermon, uh, a newcomer remarks, Who are we to say Christianity is better than any other religion? I think the essence of Jesus' teaching was love. I mean, aren't all religions the same? What's your response? you got ten seconds. Have you studied all religions, and why do you think that? Okay. 
Now, I'm not going to ask them if they studied all religions because unless they're a professor, my answer is obviously no. And so I don't like I don't like it when they can no or yes because why? Why don't I like knowing yes? Because it ends the conversation. It ends the conversation, and it shuts a door where they can escape. Okay? So, again, there's nothing wrong with what you said, but I want to avoid it when I shut a door or when they're able to shut a door on me. I want to keep the conversation going. I want them talking, especially if we're at level, if we're at the first question. So I think, well, which, which religion do you think is the same is a good answer? Uh, or, I mean, a good question. Which religions do you think are the same? Uh, I like the question, uh, really, uh, are there religions that you think that aren't based on the concept of love? Now, the person may say, well, what do you mean? Well, I mean, I know there are some religions where there's actually, they promote terrorism and harming of other people, aren't there? Are those religions the same? Uh, yeah, I see my tone of voice and... Colombo style, I'm not, I'm not offensive, am I? But I could probably end my conversation with that person by just having them think through that, right? Mm -hmm. oh, I've never thought of it, is often what I hear from people. I've never thought of it. Mm -hmm. I win. Not in the sense of I get joy, but the kingdom of God has just tilled some ground. The gardening work has been done now. In your book, he's going to give you example after example of things that he would say. Again, he's the author. He does a much better job. Uh, let me let me just go one more. Uh, you're uh, with a friend. Uh, they notice there's a Bible in your backpack. Uh, your friend says, I've read that Bible before. It's got some interesting stories, but I think people take it too seriously. After all, I mean, it's only written by men who make mistakes. Ten seconds. What are you gonna say? I'll tell you right, men do make mistakes. I That's right. Men make mistakes. I do too. Yeah. Wait a minute. Do you do you happen to have any books at your house that were written by by men? That you do you trust any of those books? Do they contain truth in them? Or are they all something we should just discard because they were written by men? Now, I haven't even got to the argument of God actually intervening and having a part in this, have I? But I'm just simply saying, yeah, well, we all make mistakes, but that doesn't mean that we can't trust it. You see, the, the assumption here is that because a man wrote it, we could insert woman, but since we're talking about the Bible, men wrote the, those books, but because a man wrote it, we can't trust it. Well, let's, let's attack the argument, which really is, well, you have books at home that you trust that were written by men. So therefore, to simply throw the Bible out the window because it's written by men, you should therefore then throw out all your books at home because they're written by men. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Okay. Again, you, you can have some fun with that and see his answers. And Ooh, that's good. And, and, and here's the only way to get good at this. is to practice. Just to practice. I sit at home and I watch atheistic YouTube videos and try to figure out what I would say back. I watch debates and try to think, well, what would I respond to? I, I, I listen to radio. Every once in a while, I, I'm, I'm just listening to the radio and I hear a commercial and I just shut it off and go, all right, what would, what would I say? We had the, the Grammy Awards, not too, was it the Grammy Awards not too long ago? Some actor things. Uh, they're all the same. Golden Globe. Not worth watching in my opinion. Golden Globes. The Golden Globes. And, and, and during the Golden Globes, somebody actually stood up and, and gave a speech for abortion. And uh, I didn't know until the next day, and I'm reading it, and I'm reading the article, and I stopped midway through the article, and I go, well, let me just look it up. So I looked it up, and I, I'm hearing this lady speak about how, uh, you know, if it wasn't for her ability to have aborted her child, at this date, she couldn't have went on and become an actor, and how she just supports, and I'm listening to like, really? <laughs> wow. And I just wanted to stop and pause and go, all right, what would I say to her? So I stopped it, and I thought, okay, well, what would I say to her? So what would you say? Just that little bit of not information you have. Your friends said to you, hey, if it wasn't for my ability to have aborted my kid, I I wouldn't have been able to go on and become a famous actor. What would you say? What was, what's How the do question? You know that? 
Okay. Explain to me how you can. How would your child have stopped you from becoming an actress? Okay. I think the mood of the room or being with them would really matter because how do you know that it could be abrasive and you know it's uh, sure. but if, if it makes them think then maybe we'll turn their child on to that. And that's a great point. Again, this is why the context of a relationship is so important. This is why there's not a here's the response you give to every question mm -hmm. or, or, or the question you give to every response. Mm -hmm. It's because why? It's because it's all contextual. You always got to be reading the room. You got to be Hey, am I starting to push this person too far? No, okay, we're, we're good. I can go one more question. Or, hey, this person's got stuff to do. I was in a conversation at the coffee shop here downtown at Lefties, and uh, the guy behind the counter had a necklace on. Anytime someone's wearing a necklace, I think it's an open door. Like, it's like an invitation. Please talk to me about my worldview. And so I, I'm, I'm looking at his necklace, but I can't quite figure out what it is. It's not a cross, but it, it looks like maybe it's an Indian symbol. Uh, and, and so I asked the guy, hey, what, what's on your necklace? And he takes 10 minutes to tell me how he's, it's part of a Buddhist sect. <laughs> and I just think to myself, why didn't you just say it was a Buddhist sect? But, uh, so it's a sect of Buddhism. Got it. It took you 10 minutes to do that. But uh, I'm listening. And, and so now I'm even, oh, oh where did I get to talk to the Buddhist? And uh, so I'm sitting there, but he's working, right? And so I got I to gotta watch him work, but now there's a wall. And I'm watching. Is there a, okay, yeah. Hey, explain to me. Give me two reasons why this religion is attractive to you. Why, why is this worldview attractive to you? And he spends time telling me about karma, and then he spends time telling me about the energy flow in and out of people, which I think actually is back to the karma thing, so he didn't really give me two answers. He thought he did. Uh, but in the midst of that, you know, he talks about the good energy and the bad energy. Now, what's the question you want to ask? Stay with your Colombo tactics. How do you determine what's good and bad energy? Who determines that? Because here's what I know. If you're part of the Buddhist religion, you ultimately are in charge of your own morals. Now see, it's a little knowledge I have in the background. It's a little thing. I know more about mums than they do. I'll hold some here real quick. Right? Or at least I know as much about mums as they do. So I know the Buddhist religion, I'm in charge of my own morals. I get to dictate those. Right? Now, that, it's a little gray area because there's many different sects of Buddhism. And that's not always true. And they, there might be an argument from the Buddhists who would say, well, hold on, that's not exactly how it works out. For the most part, that's how it works out. And so I'm wanting to attack the moral argument here and say, so who? Who gets to choose what's right and wrong? How, how do we know it's right? How do we know it's good energy? How do we know it's bad energy? Now, ultimately, if I could have spent this four more or five more questions with this guy, I would have taken him there. But uh, you know, he gave me some answer that was not really that good, which wasn't surprising because I've started peeling back the layers of the onion, right? And they're going to get very fuzzy in a hurry, especially with the Buddhist and Hindu worldview, which is already fuzzy in a hurry. And in fact, I believe most people like that worldview because it's fuzzy, right? I don't have to live morally. I don't have to come to, yes, this is right and wrong. The sad thing is, is that therefore I, I never live a truth. So I always attack it from a truth standpoint. But I wanted to get into morals, which is, okay, so I'm going to take him to the place where eventually I can ask him, so if Hitler believed what he was doing was right and that was good energy, was he then producing good karma by producing manufacturing and ordering the Holocaust. Now again, if you're in charge of morals or you believe our culture makes morals, you can't argue against that. In fact, many debates that I've watched with atheists who are smart enough will say eventually, you are correct. I can't argue from a, an objective moral standpoint that that's wrong. It's a popular vote. It's a cultural thing. And if the Nazis had one, the Holocaust would be okay. Again, if you don't have an objective moral God, you can't argue from a moral argument. Now, everybody with me so far? Again, all our goal tonight is to begin to say, hey, I want to engage people by asking questions, the Colombo questions. Let me move you back to your first page just a second. First Peter 3, 5, our job, this is a passage I want you to go home and read, but it's, it's, we should always be prepared to give a defense. 
All right. Uh, with clarity, <coughs> with grace, with persuasive uh, tactics. But we should do it in such a way that it's inoffensive. Or unoffensive, rather. Unoffensive. I'm going to do it in a way that when I'm engaging you, you don't feel like we're in a fight. Because if at any point in time the conversation moves into an argument, we both lost. Mm -hmm. I don't need an argument. I don't want an argument. Now, if you become heated, I'm going to back away. I'm going to say, hey, we can talk about something else. Uh, I may ask you, why are you so upset? Right? Because maybe... Maybe you, you don't recognize that you're excited and you're upset. Maybe the best question I have to, to ask you is, why, why, are you, why are you so upset about this? Because again, most of the time in my first two or three questions, I haven't even given you my worldview. I haven't given you anything that's too serious. I've just asked you questions for clarity of your worldview. But when someone's already upset by the, my third question, and I'm going, oh, what, why are you so excited? Right? And so sometimes that's my best question. Why, why are you so Why I'm not! <laughs> yeah, it feels like you are. I, I'm sorry I'm misreading the circumstances, right? And you've all been in that conversation, right? Where maybe it wasn't while you were trying to lead someone to Jesus, but you were in the conversation where like, clearly you are. Let's, let's change the topic, right? So again, the good news is it's okay to leave that there, right there, right? Why? Because you and I have a gardener boss who's in it for the long term. In fact, where you and I may go, hey, I only got this one shot at this relationship, or I only got this couple years, our boss says, I got eternity. Right? I got forever to work on this. Right? Or at least this person's lifetime, right? I've got this person's entire life to work on this. Now, that doesn't mean there's never a place to pull the trigger. It just means that, hey, we don't ever need to feel like we're in a rush. Now, I, again, I, I keep coming back to this because... At least for me growing up, and I was so glad that Greg started this in his first chapter, because I just always lived with such pressure to do this. And it was so intimidating because it's like, what if they ask a question I don't know? And what if we get here and I don't know what to do? And what if this happens? And I, and I, I, I got paralyzed and even engaging in conversation with someone because I felt like I got to be able to take them from A to B. But that's not the case. It's a relationship. So even if someone gets hostile with me and angry, I'm like, why are we so angry? We can change the subject. Well, we become angry with ourselves because we think we have to have the right answers. And when we don't have the right answers, then we can't communicate with them any better than they're communicating with us. Right. I mean, it just becomes a... And, and again, back to the three Columbo questions. To draw yeah. them out, uh -huh. invite them to talk, understand what they think. Usually by my third question, a lot of people don't even understand what their, what their own worldview is. Mm -hmm. Right? So, yeah, they do become like, well, like, well why do you want to know? And it's like... Just trying to understand with George. And now, again, if I, I'm trying to understand, again, I'm gracious, I'm patient, I just help me understand. And every once in a while, at that point in time, I can help them understand their own worldview. So I, what I hear you say is, what I've heard you say is, what I think you've communicated is, and again, all I'm going to do now is regurgitate back. And sometimes I can help fill in the holes in their own worldview. Now, that's always even more fun because then I, it's an open door because I'm still... I'm still in charge of the conversation. I'm still guiding. And I go, but the problem is, you see, now I can start pointing out some of the problems with the world here. Does, uh, does all that make sense? Everybody with me so far? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I want you to go to the bottom of page two with me. And this is not in the book. Uh, this is from uh, Frank Turek. Uh, and by the way, Frank Turek is one of the guys that I think is just brilliant. Uh, he goes around to college campuses and he uh, does a lot of debates or presentations on the gospel. And he speaks, and this guy knows more than I'll ever know, and he's probably forgotten more than I'll know. Uh, but when he speaks to these these college campuses, which you know, again, you want to talk about a hostile environment, you want to talk about kids who are ready to jump all over it, right? Uh, but he speaks usually in such a way that, again, he's just, he's just so knowledgeable and so unintimidating. And, and he clearly he doesn't want to fight. And so he does it in such a way that's very graceful. But the point that I'm making here is that we have to know something about the mums that we're selling, back to Becky's point, in order to win that trust. And part of the challenge for us as Christians is often we don't know enough about our own worldview 
to lead someone out of theirs and to ours. Right? And shame on us because Jesus <coughs> said, uh, when the man came and said, Jesus, what's the, what's the greatest commandment? What's the one rule I got to follow? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. mind. We left that in the trunk somewhere, right? We left our mind somewhere in the trunk, so we haven't done a good job of cultivating our mind. Now, here would just be where I would ask you, what are you listening to on your way to work? Okay, you got 15, 20 minutes, maybe just five. Okay, what are you listening to? Uh, there are a bunch of podcasts right now that are really good. Uh, Frank Turek does YouTube videos, and he makes them about uh, 30 seconds to a, about two minutes. And so if I've got a short distance, I'll often just flip on one of Frank Turek's YouTube. I've subscribed to the channel, so it comes up on my feed. And yeah, I'll, I'll listen to that real quick on my way in the Speedway, right? And, and again, he, I find that in the conversations, I know answers that I didn't study for because I've listened to them 30 times because eventually I've heard Greg say that 17 times. I've heard Ravi Zacharias say that. You know, it's, it's, wait, I know the answer to this. Right? Uh, and so, again, what are you putting in your head so that you can engage in healthy ways as we talk about this? So, what are you listening to? What are you reading? What are you studying? Whose feet are you sitting with? And what friends are you hanging out with? Okay? And so, what I want to do is I want to walk you through for about uh, just two minutes here what, what you have in front of you. And then I'm going to lead you through a couple discussions. You ready? Uh, these are arguments for God's existence. I've given you ten of them. Uh, again, I didn't make these up. These are right out of Frank, uh, Frank Turek's website. Uh, but each one of these arguments is an argument that will help you engage people in conversation. Now, what I'd like to have happen is next week, if you go, I don't understand that. Let's start the class out with, help me understand what argument number five is. I don't understand explanation for data. All right, help me understand that one, Aaron. Okay, so let's walk through that together. Okay, uh, and it may be that we end up walking through all ten of them if, if each one of us has one we don't understand, or again, two we don't understand. But what I want to do is I want to just give these to you as a little thing you can study. And again, what, what you'll be able to do is each one of these will be able to give you another avenue to ask the right question to guide the person to the answer that you want to have. So with my Buddhist friend, what you'll notice is if you if you understand these is I was taking him to the moral argument, right? With the uh, Big Bang, I was taking him to the design for creation, the teleological argument, all right? Uh, or the, it could have been the cosmological argument. It could have been either one. I didn't get far enough uh, to to reveal which one we were going to, all right? Uh, but each one of these arguments then gives you a place that hey. I, I want to guard, guide them, guide the conversation to this. All right? Does that make sense? All right, let's practice this a moment. You ready? Uh, hopefully, you've got a neighbor or two beside you that you don't hate. All right, I'm going to give you a circumstance, and one of you's got to be. Uh, let's let's do one together. We'll do one as a whole class. All right, I'll be the person that you're going to ask the questions. To. So I'm going to make a statement. Let's let's just do it as a class first, because that'll be a little less intimidating, uh, and and I'll help you guide that through. Again, this is our we're going to ride a training wheel. We're going to do Colombo tactics. Uh, just explain this to me again, right? All right, you ready? Um, here's here's a, here it is. Uh, you know what? Let's let's pick an easy one. Well, at least I think it's easy, but one that's in our, our culture all the time. You know, it's a it's a mother's right. She should be able to choose what she wants to do with her body. Therefore, I think. Abortion, abortion is a great thing, and I think everybody should too. Oh, someone be brave. <laughs> so, if you have a child already, is it still okay to kill him? Okay. Now, if you if, if you do already read that in the book, no. Oh, he'll walk you through this some of this conversation in the book. Now, and now. I want to think about the language you use here. If you have a child already, is it okay to kill him? Now, Sally, if you and I are really good friends, <laughs> it might be okay to ask that question, but already you've tipped your hand to what your belief is. So you didn't do a good job as the disheveled, clueless Columbo here. All right? Now, you've asked the question, so you're on the right track here, but 
I think you went to like question three and four. He runs into a Wiccan. And, and it's one of my favorite stories uh, at Hilltel. And he, he runs into a Wiccan at, at a grocery store, I think it is, or some shop. And she's got her little Wiccan necklace. And, and he says, well, I see you're a Wiccan. So obviously you, 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 you believe in, in the protection of all human life, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he goes, so I suppose that means that you are against abortion. Well, no, I, I mean, I mean, a woman's body, she should have the right to do whatever she wants. How many of you see the conflict in her worldview already, right? <laughs> Again, already, the two questions. <laughs> He's already led her to, ah, I'm not sure about my own worldview already, right? So, so good good start for us. All right, anybody else want to take a stab at it? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I can speak on too much. Uh, not that I know much. What I would think of is I always like to be personal with people. I mean, I really do. It's, uh, I'm very superficial on the outside, but when it comes to something like that, that, that hits home. And I want people to know that about me, only because I want them to feel comfortable saying that and believing what they believe, and then let me you know, say what I have to say. I would say it reminds me of, uh, well, if I had to do the Columbo thing, I'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but you know, I uh, thought I heard you guys. Uh, I remember my mom talking to me when I was young about making sure that I was safe. And then I remember having a girlfriend when I was young. And we thought she was pregnant. And the, going through that was the toughest thing in the world. I remember having two options. Of course, there's only two options. You have a baby or you don't. And ultimately, it turned out that um, she had yeah, she had miscarriage. And it was a relief and heartbreaking at the same time that I can say I came to a different place than you're at right now because of that. Yeah. I know I wanted to see something later. And before that, I never knew. Uh, yeah, it's a great story. We were related to the person. Uh, and your story reminds me that, again, one of the reasons why there's three questions. Understand what they think. All right? Uh, again, an assumption here is that we already know each other and we're already in a caring relationship, but your, your first question might be, oh, I'm sorry, did you have one? Because if they've, they've had an abortion, how you need to ask the next question is going to be different, right? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Or if, well, my sister had one. Oh. Huh. Well, tell me about it. Right? Now, Again, even her telling about it, she may break down and reveal that, hey, it was the worst experience. I wish I would have had to do it all. Again, you, you haven't done anything. You just share, share it. Now you're there to comfort, right? Uh, uh, she may even talk about, yeah, walking in. There were people who were holding signs telling me I was going to hell, uh, that I, I, I was a murderer, right? And from there on out, I've hated Jesus. Okay, okay, that's helpful information because now i got to change my tactic a little bit right mm -hmm. Whew, i'm glad i learned part that part of the story right and so so my first question would be oh man do you i mean have you experienced now obviously as a guy <laughs> i haven't experienced that right and so my tactics with the guy is going to be a little different i'm not going to be quite so sensitive because if a guy's had an abortion we've got other problems right uh, so my tactics <laughs> with the guy are going to be different with a gal i want to find out have you, have you had one have you close friends you had is this just a theoretical belief or is it a personal belief you have because again, when you go into a personal belief, there's a lot of emotion attached there, right? So if it's a theoretical, we don't have to deal with the emotion as much. When it becomes personal, I gotta weed through the emotions, and so my questions all change in how I handle it. Yeah, but if you're dealing with a guy and he's dealt with a girl that made the decision and and took it out of his hands, sure. Then there's a whole different ball game too. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. So, so what are some other questions I'd have? Let's say it's not a personal experience, it's just a belief this person has. <clears throat> why do you believe that? Right. Well, why do you why believe do you that? Believe Very good. Well, why do you believe that? Again, first question we have is draw them out. What, tell me why you think that. Why do you believe that? Well, I mean, look, it's a woman's right. She has the right to choose what to do with her body. And, you know, a baby's not for everybody. I mean, some people have goals in life, and they want to do things. They have things they want to do, and, and kids aren't for everybody. 
Next question. Have you ever had to make that decision? Okay. We're going to decide that they haven't had to make that decision. So okay. we're going to move on. Good it question. Be, it must be okay. It's legal. Is that right? Well, that's not a question. You made a okay. statement again. Is that right? You've told a story and made a statement. You're doing a terrible job at the Columbo. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I could act Columbo. No. Would you be able to get up? Would you be able to get up your baby? I'm sorry. Like if they, think about for the next another question, would you be able to? Would you be able to get up your baby? Would I be able to give up my baby as a next question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe. Again, we, 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 we kind of jumped from abortion to adoption, so I've already had the baby. So, so or would you be able to abort a baby? Would I be able to abort a yeah. baby? Okay, maybe. Again, it, here's what I want to avoid. I want to avoid the yes and no question. <coughs> or, excuse me, yes and no response. So it's, it's not wrong. I'm trying to be very caring with everybody here because, again, we're all learning, right? Including me. I get better at this every day, right? Uh, so, and then what's another next question? This is hard, isn't it? <laughs> so, uh, again, let me just give you a couple of examples of where the conversation could go. Okay, and I want to ask the question. So we've already asked, so why do you believe it? Well, I believe in what you heard is that the person say, well, it's going to hinder what I want to do in life. Again, I would have asked the, uh, the actress the same thing, too. Like, how is that going to hinder what you want to do in life? Is there a way that having children could actually help those goals or make them better or it, I mean there's nobody arguing that they would be different I just help me understand how having a child hinders what you want to do in life now you see again I'm still not offended yet or, or pushing them too hard I might be tipping my hat just a little bit but I'm still trying to understand how, how does having a child mean you can't succeed in life because in the back of my mind I'm going I know lots of people who are successful have kids right and you're thinking the same thing too like I know lots of people, right? Uh, so why does this person believe having children prevents you from succeeding? Because there's obviously a story there that I don't know about, right? So I'm going to keep pushing some of those buttons. Uh, I want to ask, you know, all kinds of questions around the sanctity of life. Because ultimately the, the abortion issue becomes when is it a person and when is it just a living creature, Right? And when we delineate between those two things, we get into all kinds of hot water. We end up in the Nazi extermination camps again, right? Because when I can remove your personhood from you and just make you a living creature, it's easier to shoot and kill you. Right? It's easier to remove you because you no longer have the same value because you're not a person. So when does it become a person? What defines a person? How do we know what a person is? Is it possible for a person to lose their value? And not be a person anymore. What would it take for a person not to be a person anymore? And his wouldn't, story with the wouldn't it, wouldn't your your outlook on that question also be affected by the influences around you? Absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, some parents wouldn't give a, you know, what happened if you got pregnant, and then there's others that would, uh, they would disown you because you had an abortion, and there are others that would say. I will not support you if you don't get rid of this baby. Right. So I, and I don't know. It just seems like that would be a, how what what your influence of your family is. In, Absolutely. And where you go on in life. Again, that's why those first couple of mm -hmm. questions of explain why mm -hmm. you believe what you believe. You're going to get that story mm -hmm. out. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're going to get that story out. All right. Hopefully, what you walk away from the night is going. Whew, this is hard. <laughs> hopefully, what you walk away going is though. But I think if I work at this, I can do this. And that's the point with our tactics. If they were easy, we'd all already be doing it, and the whole world would know Jesus. Tonight, I want to begin to dip your toes into the deep water and say, you're going to be okay. You can do this. All right? Thank you, guys. Blessings. Have a good night. Don't forget to watch an episode of Columbo. <laughs> Everybody go home to Hulu Columbo. You want to hear that song?